Welcome everyone to One Law for All and South All Black Sisters webinar. Uh, this is on the issue of uh, marriage in the family law and particularly when it comes to religious only marriages and how it adversely affects women, especially women from minority backgrounds. And we're having this webinar today, obviously because it coincides with the Law Commission's inquiry into this issue and the fact that they're looking at marriage law. So we do want to raise our concerns as women's rights organizations about the inadequacy of the laws and also uh, provide recommendations on how we feel that the situation can be improved, particularly for my minority women who've been coerced uh, or deceived into having religious only marriages. Now we've got uh, some of the most brilliant women's rights campaigners in Britain. We've got the wonderful Gita Sarkal, who's a spokesperson of One Law for All. We've got the amazing uh, Pragna Patel, who is the director of South Hall Black Sisters, the wondrous uh, women's rights campaigner Yasmin Rehman. Uh, we've also got a, a wonderfully brave survivor of a religious only marriage, Uzma, who will be speaking today uh, with her video off. Um, and uh, we've got a video uh, submission from um, a Jewish uh, social activist uh, who deals with extremism in the Jewish community and women's rights in, in that community, Yehudas Fletcher. So we'll be showing her comments on this issue as well. Um, so I think if um, you don't mind, we'll just get straight into it. Let me also introduce myself before I forget. I'm Mariam Namazi. I'm a close person of One Law for All with Gita Sakyal because I know we have so many wonderful women's rights campaigners and activists here in this room. And, you know, we, uh, we know that your um, experience uh, will will be very important in us looking at this issue. Um, so let me begin with uh, Pragna Patel. Thank you so much, Mariam, for creating this space to have what I think is a really, really urgent and important discussion. So I'm really pleased to be here with my fellow uh, panelists um, and, and particularly with Osma. Um, in terms, in, in relation to having this discussion, um, as you said, it's against the backdrop of what the Law Commission is doing at the moment, mm. which is looking at the whole question of wedding law. Mm. Um, and we, along with others I know, have made a submission saying that uh, marriage laws need to be reformed mm. to include more protection for minority women. Yeah, let, so, let me, sorry, let me ask you, I, I guess uh, if yeah. we can go, you know, let's go step by step and go through the basics. One is, one issue is when we're talking about religious only marriages, mm -hmm. uh, there is this issue where a lot of women choose to have religious only marriages. And, uh, you know, there is the question of one people's right to religion, of course, and how they choose to get married. That's, that's a really crucial right, as well as, uh, the right to uh, decide uh, when and how some, something so important can, can take place. So it's a question of choice as well, a question of uh, the right to religion as well. What are the concerns then that uh, you have when we're talking about religious only marriages within a, a context of women's rights? Well, I think the first thing I want to say is that this idea of choice is a very loaded one, isn't it, for us feminists? Um, of course, everyone should have a choice, should have choice in marriage, religious or not. Um, and in fact, you know, as feminists, that's exactly what we've been struggling for all these years, for the right to, for women to have choice in marriage, in who they marry, how they marry, when they get married. And uh, we've been campaigning around this for years, which is why we now have laws on forced marriage, for example. So I'm, I don't think any of us are opposed to anyone having a religious only marriage or for that matter, any other kind of marriage that they choose. Um, if that's what they wish, then that's absolutely fine and everybody should have the right to do so. I'm more worried about those who promote religious marriage 
at the expense of civil marriages and what that means in terms of women's rights. So I think that's the question. So what concerns us is the fact, as you pointed out in your introduction, that many women are being coerced and deceived into having a religious marriage only. Um, they're, they're being told by both their partners, but also by religious and community leaderships that only a religious marriage is legitimate and that a civil marriage doesn't matter at all. And the problem with this is that in recent times, more and more women are entering into only religious marriages. And this means that when their marriage breaks up, usually due to domestic abuse, um, and um, they try to go to court to seek uh, redress in terms of um, access to legal remedies following the breakup of their marriage, um, they're told that they have no rights, that they do not have any entitlements following the breakup of their marriage in relation to particularly property and financial matters. So that's our concern, that there are no remedies for women who, after having a religious-only marriage, find themselves left high and dry by both their abusive partners, by their communities, and indeed by the state itself for allowing this to happen. And what we're seeing is that um, there is growing evidence, really increasing evidence to show that women are, in, uh, minority women are entering into religious only marriages. They're on the rise. And that is not an accident. It's also coinciding with the rise of and spread of religious fundamentalism and conservative politics in minority communities in the, in this, in the UK. And what we're seeing is that religious only marriages are being more and more pursued and they've been exploited and they're in fact being normalized um, to the advantage of men um, and thereby exacerbating gender inequality and gender-based violence. So I wanted to make two key points about this idea of choice that you've raised. The first is that many of the women who seek help tell us that the religious marriage that they've entered was not out of choice, um, but as a result of deception and coercion. So many tell us about how they had no say in who they married, how they married, when they married, who conducted the ceremony and so on. And few have any knowledge of the legal consequences of not having a civil marriage. But actually, even if they did know the consequences of having a, a civil marriage, uh, of not having a civil marriage, many find themselves powerless to do anything about it. So that's the first point. And in these circumstances, we argue that deception and coercion lie at the heart of women's decisions to have a religious only marriage. Um, and at a time when there is growing awareness of what constitutes coercive behavior um, in the context of marriage, um, and, and a time when there is an understanding that that coercion and control involves a range of power tactics, power and control tactics that include physical, sexual, financial, um, and psychological abuse, we would argue that deception is also part of that coercion dynamic. And in fact, it is a key feature of religious only, many uh, religious only marriages because women are lied to, they're misled about, um, about the status of their marriage. And it's one of the most common tactics used by men and their families to gain power and control over them. So when women enter into a religious only marriage in these circumstances, what they're doing is exercising a very coerced form of consent. It's not choice. Um, and many of our users highlight how men and their families exclude women from their rights by deliberately manipulating the pre-marriage situation to ensure non-compliance and non-participation with the requirements of civil registration. So the deception begins pre-marriage and then can, is reinforced through the duration of marriage, through physical and other forms of abuse and control. 
And, and the key driver of such abuse is the desire to keep control of family and, and um, marital wealth. And this is why we argue that deception in these circumstances constitutes both a form of psychological abuse, but also financial abuse, and is part of the wider coercive control dynamics that we see in relationships where there is abuse. And the other point I want to make about choice is that um, often those who compel women to have only a religious marriage invoke the right to manifest religion um, or the idea that, you know, it's religious freedom and people are entitled to, to exercise their religious freedom. But its effect is to deliberately deprive women of their marital assets and their substantive rights in marriage. Um, and so the question is, does the right to manifest religion or belief or uh, freedom of religion, can, does, can that or should that trump women's substantive rights to equality in marriage? And we say that it, it, if, if religion is allowed to trump women's equality in marriage, then it amounts to a breach of their human rights. Um, Article 15 and 16 of CEDAW, for example, clearly states that governments must adopt appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women in all matters relating to marriage and family relations. And this means that governments or states must take account of culture and religion that prevent women from exercising their rights in, you know, in marriage. Um, and so it is a breach of women's human rights, and that cannot be trumped by the right to manifest religious, religion or beliefs. So the final point I want to make about choice is, as I've said, it's a constraint, it's a choice that's exercised in very constraining circumstances. I think it not only leads to a series of harmful consequences, but itself is a form of harm. I think it amounts to a harmful marriage practice. And we need to argue this more forcefully because the sole intention of those promoting religious only marriages is to deprive women of their substantive rights and to subjugate them to patriarchal and religious authority. Okay, thank you very much, Pragna. So, I mean, obviously, um, the argument then is clearly that people have a right to uh, religious marriages, but I think our position is that civil marriages, for example, could be made compulsory. That would be one argument yeah. we would make. And yeah. we, we will go into that further down the line. Uh, so I think when, when you put it the way that you do about the deception, about the coercion, about not seeing that, uh, and that therefore meaning that women have very little remedies available to them or no remedies effectively yeah. uh, when there's violence or divorce taking place. Um, you know, can you explain in lay person's terms? Uh, I mean, we'll talk about the law further down, but why is women's experiences not being taken into consideration uh, at, with the law as it stands right now? I think that there are, there are lots of reasons why the law is just not is failing to understand minority women's positions. I mean, it, it just doesn't understand the wider context in which minority women exercise choice, as I've explained. I think there are two major reasons. One is ideological. I think it's dressed as public policy, you know, matters. And, and the state is hell bent on maintaining the sanctity of marriage at all costs. And so, um, and I think it's doing that partly to appease religious leaderships. So that's one reason. Another reason is I think that in these times of austerity and the context of neoliberalism in which we, you know, it, which is the environment we inhabit, I think the state is trying to outsource justice. And what better way than to sort of outsource justice for minority women because you can leave them, relegate them to their communities and community structures. So I think, um, you know, this is new. We're, through the ages, one of the things that we've always challenged is the way in which the state has constantly delivered minority women back into the hands of community leaderships, which are increasingly fundamentalist and conservative. And the state has always been happy 
to leave minority women's access to protection and justice um, in the hands of religious bodies um, who are increasingly seeking to oust secular law from women's lives. Um, so it's the outsourcing mm. of justice, the uh, appeasing of religious leaders, and that means um, creating spaces um, that allow religious bodies to set up arbitration tribunals, for example, to set up community-based systems of uh, dispute resolution. Um, and again, we've done a lot of work and there is you know, considerable evidence out there which shows that these dispute mechanisms, which are inevitably based on very conservative interpretations of religion, um, actually minimize or deny women's experiences of abuse um, and deprive women of their rights in relation to children, in relation to family, you know, property matters, uh, marital assets, and in, in relation to divorce. And yet the state does nothing about this. And, and instead, what the state says is that, you know, um, we will at best let some other body like the Law Commission deal with the problem, the massive, the serious, the huge problem of minority women's rights in the family justice system. Um, and the Law Commission, interestingly, says, no, no, this is not our problem because it's too substantive for us. Let, let the courts deal with it. So what we see is actually minority women you know, sort of being shunted from pillar to post with no one taking responsibility for protection and justice and leaving them um, into the hands, you know, in the hands of very regressive forces in our communities. Um, so I think, you know, there are, there are probably many, many other reasons why this, the law fails women, but these are just some. Okay, thank you very much, Pragna. We'll get back to you again, uh, but if I'd, I'd like to now uh, speak to Uzma, if that's possible. Um, Uzma is um, a, a survivor of a religious-only marriage, um, and um, it would be great to hear from you now, if, if possible, Uzma. Uh, I think you'd need to unmute your microphone. Yes, good evening, oh, everyone. Perfect. Hello, Osma. Thank you so much for uh, joining um, us. Uh, can I okay. ask? Can I ask you? Um, obviously, you've heard uh, things Pragna has said, and it would be great to hear your uh, your viewpoint on that. But I want to also start by asking you about your own experience and how it relates to what Pragna is saying. You yourself had a religious only marriage in a mosque in two thousand and nine. And I guess I'd like to ask, you know, what happened that you had a religious only marriage? Why didn't you register your marriage? Uh, if you can explain some of that for us as well. So it, things are more clear as well on, on how it, what, what takes place uh, when women uh, go through religious only marriages, if there's deception or coercion involved. Please. Um, Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank South Hall Black Sisters. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Everyone? Perfectly. Hello? We, we Can hear you hear me? We hear you perfectly. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to... You hear me? Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank South Hall Black Sisters to give me the opportunity to talk about my life experience. My name is Uzma, and I'm a victim of domestic abuse and a mother of three children. I met my ex-husband in 2008. It was a love come arranged marriage. We had an Islamic religious only marriage in 2009 in a large mosque. When I got married, I believed this marriage is for life and I wanted to share and grow in this marriage. Um, I was uh, deceived. I was made to believe that the ma mosque I was getting married to is recognized and registered. So. In particular, I believe that uh, it is recognized by this government, as in it's a legal marriage. An imam from the mosque came with two witnesses, which came from his, and he had come with two witnesses from his side of the family and took my signatures. We had 500 guests who attended the wedding. It was a big wedding, and it all seemed like a fairy tale. My ex-husband made me believe that this mosque is registered and recognized, so... In my view, in my opinion, I know that, you know, I'm getting into a marriage which is legal and recognized and I have my rights 
women, my right as a wife. We lived in a beautiful home with three children. I was a homemaker and I took care of everything. Me and my ex-husband were having marital problems on and off from the beginning because of his parents. It got worse in September 2018. My mother was sick and he convinced me to go to India. And he said, it's half term. I'll look after the children. Please go. Look after your mom. It will be hard. It will be a struggle with the children in the hospital. And I went to India. And within a week, he he did not allow me to speak to my children. And I panicked. I was like, what's wrong? What's going on here? You know? And um, I was worried. And I decided to come back to the UK because he would just not answer my calls. He would not let me speak to my children. And while I was on the way to the UK, to the airport, I was detained by Indian immigration because he gave false information. I was abused and detained for 13 days and released on bail after intervention from home office. He sent me his third talaq, it means divorce, on a WhatsApp in August 2009. It was as simple as that, that this marriage just ended and it was over. I was devastated, first from being separated from my children and now I was divorced. He stopped sending me any money and I had nothing to arrange and pay for my return to the UK. After a lot of efforts, I returned safely to the UK in December after the immigration inquiry was over. He knew that if I return, he does not have to give me anything financially. He took a non-molestation order and just like that, I could not return to my family home and my own children. Upon my return, I was homeless. I had to sleep at the airport without any food and money for two days. I did not have any friends or family to go to. My brother arranged for me to sleep at his friend's couch until I managed to get a placement in the refuge through the council in December. I contacted the mosque and found out that the mosque is not recognized or registered and my marriage is not legal in the eyes of this government. Because this marriage was not registered, that means I was cohabiting and I have no financial remedy from the wealth that was acquired by me and my ex-husband while I was married to him. I looked after the home, children, his parents, and made his house a home, and I had no right to live in that home anymore. I was betrayed, and I felt helpless. I was depressed. I was sad. I was anxious. I didn't know what to do, where to go. What should I do? Because I did not know the system, the legality, and what did I do with my life? I gave 10 years to this marriage and I was left with nothing, absolutely nothing. I was homeless. I applied for universal credit and I got my benefits end of January. I was given food vouchers and I somehow survived until benefits started. I was this woman who used to buy food, fraud food banks and donate. And today I had no choice but to eat from food banks. What has happened with me was a plan and this is what he wanted. He secured himself. So just in case, if you ever get divorced, he will not have to give me anything. He's a millionaire. I'm married for life. He married for convenience. Right now, I'm fighting for my children. There is a child arrangement order in place. I have been separated for 20 months from my children, three young children. I see my children once a week for an hour in a supervised contact center. The children are also under child protection plan because of mental and emotional abuse. My life was taken away. My children are taken away. I have to make my life from the scratch and be dependent on this government to look after me. It's my right on that home. I have right on my children, but just because of the fact that my marriage is not legal, my life has become a struggle. I'm trying to get my life back on track. It has been a very difficult journey for 20 months. In Islam, there is a procedure in place to provide for maintenance in case of a divorce for a woman to restart her life. But unfortunately, no one follows it because there is no penalty or law if anyone does not follow. That leaves us women with nothing. This government needs to do something where they can secure women of this country from domestic abusers. I'm a British citizen, but at this minute, 
you know i feel so helpless i feel that if there was anything the government could do to give me my rights it would be so helpful in this time when i'm struggling with little things the the government she needs to do something where they can secure the women there must be a law for every religious marriage to be civil registered by law so we can have save millions of minority women who are vic- victims of domestic abuse it is time that the government takes the necessary steps to save god vulnerable women and children and give us us, us our basic rights if you have any questions please ask okay thank you very much osman i'm really sorry to hear all that you've been through um and also the fact that you still don't have your your children uh with you uh, i mean one of the things i guess that um uh, i'd like to know more of is i mean you did talk about all the difficulties you've been having but if if you just can tell us a bit more about the sort of obstacles you've been faced you faced with to get your uh, to to try to get some legal rights so uh you mentioned that you contact the mosque what sort of legal procedures have you been through uh what sort of support have you received that that would be helpful to to know as well about the the whole process and the difficulties you've you faced in addition to the things you've uh, mentioned already um please go ahead um i got this support from the refuge i was staying who have guided me into understanding uh to go and meet some solicitors who would explain me what situation i am in at the moment i don't have any financial remedy as a wife but there is a procedure wherein just if the children do come to me i can apply for schedule one where i he has to secure a property under children's trust where i can live in the property until the youngest one is 21 if he uh, wants to stay with me until he's 21 that is so that is the only option i have and child maintenance but financial remedy as a wife just because my marriage was not uh, a civil registry it was just a islamic only marriage i don't have any other rights as a wife which i could have been easily awarded if my marriage was recognized and uh, you know because i know i was not cohabiting this government takes these marriages as cohabiting i was not cohabiting i got married i got married for life i we introduced ourselves in the society as husband and wife okay there are women who go into um um live in relationships or cohabiting in our religion we don't cohabit we ma- get married and there's not much a woman can do how much powerful educated or whoever you are to have this say that you know what i want a civil registry even if i was not deceived even if i was just going going ahead and getting married um even if i was aware there's not much i can do to have a say that it has to be registered third world countries like india it is compulsory to register your marriage within one month of your religious marriage it's a law by law you are supposed to do that they are doing this to secure women because obviously india being such a big country with so many religion and uh, people coming from all walks of lives and culture they want to make sure that the women of their country is safe from this because this happens you don't see this in the beginning of a marriage but things happen anything can happen so vulnerable women are left vulnerable because we don't go ahead and earn the money the man is the provider he's the one who's looking after the family earning money if i was aware then i would have done my own security by working and not giving full time to the family we are not aware that something like this coming up in 10 years of your life 12 years of your life or 15 years of life you'll be left on the road i am 39 now and i have to start as if i was 20 just out of university and my parents have asked me to go ahead and look and make your own life i don't have the same energy which i had 20 years ago i'm a different person i'm a mother of three children i have responsibilities so it's very difficult for me to rebuild my life all over again and just if this marriage was recognized i was hoping i have spoken to solicitors we were hoping a lot that if we could have got some i was hoping if akhtar versus khan which was in the favor and then obviously it got changed so if 
we would have got something out of that case then there was a chance there was a hope for me to have a financial remedy which now has gone away so it's not that i have not done my research i have spoken to solicitors and do whatever best i can to get the best not for myself also for my children if they come and be with me which is also in the process okay. if they do come to me the life will be a struggle yeah. now that thank you uh, very much um usma for for sharing um that with us i think it just puts everything into perspective and really makes it very clear how unjust the law is as it stands now uh, especially in situations where there's coercion and deception uh we will come back to uh, to you again and i'm sure our guests have lots of questions for you as well but if i can now ask uh, geeta sahgal to please um uh come and um i'd like to ask you geeta uh one of the things that of course um we heard uh from uh, usma's uh, statement was about the issue of immigration and we know that we live in a very hostile environment right now can you comment on on the effects of that on these sorts of marriages and cases please yes thank you mariam and thank you so much usma for telling us your story um uh, because i think many people don't really understand exactly what is happening with the issue of religious only marriages and the denial of rights uh to women from uh minorities and it is difficult to listen to your story but it's really important for us to you know be able to understand exactly what's happened and there's one aspect of it which for which we're grateful which is that usma is actually a british citizen so she was able to come back to the country even though she suffered from these false allegations laid against her being detained in india which must have been absolutely traumatic being separated from her children but she is back in the country for many other women they are not, they are dumped abroad uh, after having been married here for years or maybe for a short time what whatever length of time uh, without having secured any nationality rights any citizenship rights so the hostile environment uh, and severe immigration controls work in tandem with community pressure and men use the fact that there's a hostile environment just as was my described to deprive women of their rights and then use that in order to harass them and set law against them or just to you know get persuade them to go abroad and then leave them abroad and in many cases they can't even come back but when they do come back as usma's done they you know they have a huge fight still ahead of them to secure any rights so the two things are working in tandem and what the state is concerned about is what they call sham marriages so i think from the point of view for one law for all we think of the right to marry and the right to choice in marriage and therefore not to marry as well is it's a human right to be able to marry or to decide not to marry um but that right has been severely curtailed by a whole lot of barriers to marriage where people want to get married by the state and as i said that gap is exploited that protection gap is exploited quite deliberately um by men so many women believe they're in a legally valid marriage and in the end they're not uh and yet you find there's i'm sure a whole lot of we are aware of at least one study but there may be many other studies underway which are getting very excited by the fact that there are some young people who choose to have religious only marriages and this is considered them um exercising their religious rights and uh their right to have a sexual life and their right to conform to their religion and it's considered very exciting and postmodern and all wonderful uh because this is a way where you can be religious and be sexy and have your boyfriend who is you know your husband but you don't actually tell anybody and i, I hope uh, yasmin uh, as a muslim will address how these things have changed in the community but this is a new phenomenon and what it's come out with and it, this is particularly among muslims what we find i think um uh, you know pragna may want to correct me if i'm wrong but my understanding is that the collapse of civil marriages has taken place 
more among Muslim communities than other communities. Other communities are also affected by the hostile environment. So that is used by men in, very, in all sorts of uh, backgrounds, um, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Jewish communities who will use the fact that women do not have rights in this country and, and therefore you deploy the hostile environment against them. But the collapse of civil marriages, I believe, has come for, about for a very specific reason. And that is because of a rising fundamentalist threat where the view of religious only marriage uh, as the only acceptable form of marriage. I mean, there's an active hostility towards civil marriages and a, a propaganda that, that, that um, you know, a marriage must be a religious marriage in a community that historically the nikah, the, the, the Muslim religious marriage is actually a social contract. It's a civil contract historically. So it's, it's never been a religious marriage. It is a civil contract between uh, two parties, uh, but it's been converted by fundamentalists into a religious marriage and there's a hostility to civil marriages taking place. So in effect, it's a community level zina. That is a, 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 a law that is at the, in England at a community level, not a legal law in Saudi Arabia, until recently in Pakistan, um, Iran and many other countries, sex outside marriage is a sin public punishable by death. It's, it's more, it's worse than committing mass murder. Um, so uh, obviously in England, th that law doesn't exist, but the pressure of that kind of law to have a religious only marriage and therefore to be forced into a Sharia court in order to have and I say court like that because they call themselves courts and they behave as if they're issuing ju judicial proceedings. So they're, they're coercing women to go to them in order to get divorced. As Uzma described, her husband didn't have to recourse to any form of court, religious or otherwise. He divorced her by text. And that was accepted as a divorce by, I assume, the Muslim authorities. But where a woman wants a divorce, she has to go to one of these courts um, and uh, put, get put through a lot of abuse and humiliation in order to get her divorce. And even sometimes if she has a civil marriage, she's told she still has to get a religious divorce in order for her to be able to marry again within the community if she wants to marry another Muslim. And this is something that's quite new. It's not been there historically in this country. Um, it's it's a, a, a very modern phenomenon. And I think it's very dangerous. I mean, following up on what you've said, and you have uh, referred to it, as has um, Pragna when she was initially speaking, about how the rise of religious-only marriages is very much linked to the rise of fundamentalism. Uh, and, and because of, of course, Islamic fundamentalism, but also other fundamentalisms that are taking advantage of limiting the, the space and rights for women. So if you can uh, just briefly uh, respond to that, because I have one other quick question I need to ask you, and I'm cognizant of the time as well. Well, yes, it is It is about the rise of religious fundamentalism. As, as you know, Mariam, I mean, we put in um, a lot of evidence, which you'd researched, in fact, uh, to um, the Home Office, uh, Home Affairs Select Committee at the time that we, um, uh, when they had an inquiry into Sharia, and um, uh, they, they closed down the inquiry and came to no decisions whatsoever. But the evidence that we found was that um, a, a lot of the councils are doing this. They are pushing religious-only marriages, and then they're uh, really pressing for religious divorces. Among Hindus, there's a different set of problems, related but different, but it's to do, and in, in, in all these communities, it's to do with keeping various forms of coercive arranged marriages or keeping marriages within the community, within the religious community, or within a particular sect of the religious community. And so uh, with the Hindu right in this country, they have campaigned very hard uh, not to get uh, what's called untouchability recognized as a form of discrimination. Um, uh, because uh, as one Hindu leader said, he called it cultural genocide. And it's very bewildering why he should be suddenly talking about cultural genocide. But if you unpicked what he was saying, was he was saying that the whole arranged marriage system 
will collapse if people are go allowed to go and marry whoever they want to marry. And they may marry people from different castes, uh, uh, God forbid, and uh, you know, Hindu society would come to an end. Uh, and the British government has actually accepted this view and has you know, not put into law one of the oldest forms of discrimination in the world has not refused to recognize it and said, you can fight this issue on a case by case basis, but that means fighting it in the employment tribunals for, um, you know, in public, in, 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 in terms of what, what happens uh, in employment, but there's no remedy for people who, you know, might be discriminated against or uh, very little understanding of the kind of pressures within the community on these issues. Um, so you know in terms of marriage um so i think these are these are issues that are facing different communities in slightly different ways but all of them are to do with the rise of religious fundamentalism uh thank you gita i think i'll move on and i'll come back to you again just because i want to make sure everybody gets a chance to talk thank you very much if i can ask uh, uh yasmin now to uh yasmin rahman to um come on uh, and unmute herself. Um, I guess for, for Yasmin, um, there are, um, there is, um, I'd like to ask you about the whole issue of polygamy, zina, um, and areas of work that you've researched for, for many years. Um, um, if you can, uh, sorry, I'm just going to ask you to start your video as well. If you can expand on how uh, you see the links you see between the issue of polygamy, zina, and how all of these are impacting uh, to deny women their rights uh, in the family and in marriage in particular. Okay, um, can I just begin by saying thank you to um, Mariam and to my fellow panelists, but particularly to Uzma. Um, I think your bravery should be commended and um, I can't imagine what you're going through. I want to make Another point very quickly, Mariam, um, this, this webinar has arisen from a consultation that the Law Commission um, is undertaking at the moment. And I think we cannot deny the timing of this. This is happening at a time when, where you know, the women's sector, those of us who are working every day to protect women and children at risk, vulnerable women and children from all communities, that this should come out quite quietly and at a time when, when we're absolutely stretched. And I, I, I do question what is behind that. Um, the other point I wanted to make very quickly is by making all marriages civil marriages, first of all, with a religious marriage following afterwards, not within a month, I would actually change it from what the situation is in Pakistan and India, but actually um, would like to see civil, the civil marriage take place first, followed by the religious marriage, does not undermine anyone's right to have a religious marriage. As a Muslim woman, the nikah is an important thing to me. It's important to have both. I would like the protection of the state, should my spouse, God forbid, no longer be around, or should our marriage end. Um, but I would also like to have that, re that relationship recognized through my religion. Um, and, that, you know, and that is important to a lot of women of faith. And if you don't have a faith, again, to have the ceremony that you choose to have, is also equally important. But the consultation is about the religionizing of marriage. And I wonder about the voices that are informing the Law Commission. We talked a lot about domestic violence, but let's also not forget when there is the death of a spouse, that those women who are in religious only marriages, those children have no recourse to financial protection, paying the pension of the spouse who's passed away. They cannot claim an inheritance and you know, resorting to some religious tribunal will also not protect them because the spouse has passed on and um, we know what happens in those situations. So what I have seen in three decades, more than three decades of working on women's human rights is a real shift in the community. And I've spent the last, last seven, eight years, I've interviewed almost 100 men and women about their experiences of Muslim men and women. Um, about their experiences of multiple marriage and different marriage practices. And I've called for um, the, the same thing that Pragna has called for, um, a recognition of harmful marriage practices. And I think that what is happening within the community that I come from is that there is an undermining of the sanctity of marriage. There's a constant circumventing of the, of 
of both religious law and of the civil law. Um, in Islam, marriage is a civil contract. It's not a sacrament in the same way that it is in Christianity. What I have seen is from my work on forced marriage is young, young men and young women who are in, want to enter into a sexual relationship. And for them, having something that says that that is a, a legitimate sexual relationship requires a nagar ceremony. So imams have been conducting marriages with just with two witnesses there, not with a guardian. So stepping outside of the guardianship rulings, which you know, are problematic anyway, and conducting these marriages. These marriages happen, happen in secret. The relationship breaks down after a period of time. Young man goes off on his merry way. The young girl is left. She has never told anyone in her family that she has undergone the, this nikah and then her marriage is arranged with someone else. So she finds herself trapped within two nikahs because she's still married to the first one who hasn't divorced her. And then she ends up with a nikah with the second one. Neither of those relationships are civil marriages. And I've heard, I've, I've dealt with a number of women in that situation, including some women who are then being blackmailed by the, the first husband, if you like, um, or um, his associates and living under constant fear and the stress that that caused and the, the mental health impact um, is immeasurable. So I think we need to be looking at what happens in those contexts. I'll come on to polygamy in a, in, a, in a short while, but both temporary marriage, mutha marriages, which are Shia practices, but I've now seen happen more and more across different sects of Islam, and polygamous marriages. And when I talk about polygamy, it's a catch-all. I'm talking about um, men who marry more than one wife. It's the same, I think, as the case that I described around forced marriage. These quasi-marriages through which couples seek to legitimize their sexual unions religiously, whilst at the same time simultaneously avoiding the full burden of a marriage, be that social, be that financial, be that legal, and sometimes familial, that it comes with having a recognized civilly registered marriage. So if the marriage dissolves, they don't, as we've already heard from Usma, they escape all of their responsibilities. I've I've spoken to elders within our community and asked about religious only marriages. And they say, we do not, you know, under English law, um, you know, the um, wife has a right to property. And this is a way of protecting not just the husband's property, but also um, his family's property. But I'm also hearing the family, the families of young women saying exactly the same. We want to protect our assets. She's entered into this marriage with certain assets and we're trying to protect those. And by doing so, they're undermining the protection of, of their daughter and any grandchildren that arise from that marriage. Mutter marriages have become um, a practice that has gone way beyond Shia Muslims. And it, it's a way of having a... Um, you know, a religiously sanctioned um, sexual relationship. And for me, that undermines completely not just the sanctity of marriage, but what is the understanding of marriage? Are you making a commitment for a lifelong relationship from which children may or may not ensue? Or is this just a short term fix so that, you know, that, that you can go and have a very, um, what's the difference between that and having a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Why go through the process of a nikah? Um, the other point I wanted to make is where you do have, because there are some families who are deeply concerned about um, their daughters, particularly not having protections. And we've seen this rise in conservative fundamentalist Islam, which is not the Islam I grew up with, nor the Islam I recognize. But these demands for public manifestations of piety in the way that we dress, in the way that we speak, in the way that we conduct our lives, including our marriages. So when the families of young women are arranging their daughters' marriages and they say, we would like to see have the civil marriage first, the response is often, Let, don't worry about it. Allah will take care of it. We'll do this. You have our word. We will have the civil marriage. And to challenge that would somehow be, do you not trust me? Do you not think I'm a Muslim? And this is what comes back. And that demand for those public manifestations of piety, I think, puts such pressure on the families of young women 
that they feel that they too are coerced by this process. The last point I wanted to make was around some, some things within um, the consultation which were very particular about the role of imams. The British state has elevated imams to a status that they will ne would never have had in our countries of origin. So my parents hail from um, the, the Indian subcontinent um, across various borders. Um, the imam was someone you went to to check about prayer times, to check about when fasting was happening or the sighting of the moon or about religious practice. But the imam now has become, um, there is almost the state trying to create a hierarchy in Islam that is similar to that within Judaism and within Christianity. Islam has never had that, it's had a much more free flowing um, religious structure. And by giving, by imbuing imams with this status and this power, I think has, has disadvantaged our community and left us very exposed to those fundamentalist forces. Imams would, if this consultation paper were to go through and some of the recommendations, imams would have the right to say no to particular marriages. They could be interfaith marriages. And Islam is very clear that men can marry women of the book, but women cannot marry non-Muslims. Imams could refuse to conduct marriages between Shias and Sunnis, or Sunnis and Wahhabis, certainly but marriages between a Sunni and an Emadi or a Shia and an Emadi. Um, and that would cause, you know, that would be very problematic for some. Um, interracial marriages could be refused. And I have personal experience. I'm, I'm um, married to a white man, as many people know. And we really struggled to get an imam to conduct our nikah. We would have a situation where same-sex marriages would be refused because Islam does not permit same-sex marriage. It doesn't, you know, doesn't condone homosexuality. Where does that sit with our equalities legislation? Where does that sit with our human rights legislation? Um, again, from my research and from my interviews, where I have spoken to couples who, um, in polygamous marriages, and that crosses racial boundaries, um, or it's crossed, um, it, those, those interviews I've done where they've crossed um, re you know, religious boundaries as well. I've been told about, um, one man described it to me as, um, it was a conversion of convenience, she, she's a Muslim, she wanted the marriage, so I just went along with it. Um, but I'm actually not, not a Muslim. And, I'm, and then you have the other side where you have pressure put on one party, who, the non-Muslim party, to convert. Is that what we want to see happening? So I'm deeply concerned about the trajectory that we're on. I'm also worried about the concept of Zina Gita has touched on. And, and Zina carries huge consequences in, in Muslim majority countries, um, usually for women, not necessarily for the men. I'm worried about what the consequences of this will be. We're already seeing young women placed in incredibly vulnerable situations. And I'm also, from my research, seeing that impacting on, on women of different age groups. So it's not just young women, women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, who may have got divorced, who were then pressured into becoming second and third wives with a religious only marriage without any protection of the state or of the state's law. And the Sharia courts do not protect those women. They're the only redress that they have, but they offer no protection, as we've heard very clearly from Usma's case. Okay, thank you so much, Yasmin. I, I, I guess I want to ask you one quick other question, uh, but I wanted to tell the participants uh, if you would like to ask a question, if you can put your name in the chat, uh, you can either write your question in the chat, which might make it easier given that we still have so much to cover and uh, we have only half an hour left. So, uh, but, but depending, if we don't have too many questions, then we can always um, have you come up to uh, uh, make your own uh, comment or ask your own question. So please feel free to start posting in the chat. Uh, 
um, Yasmin, I wanted to ask you about uh, something that you did mention before. And this is that um, any male member or any community member can, for example, do a nikah, it can take place anywhere. And that that's quite worrying as well, because it's very little, very difficult to manage. I know some people uh, advocate regulating uh, these uh, religious only marriages. And there is a problem with uh, regulation. Uh, we have a problem with regulation as well. Uh, but if you can explain why there's a problem with regulation and why regulation won't really work in, in such situations. Okay. So when we look at the buildings, um, we look at where marriages take place. It's about having a building that's sanctioned to where for marriages to take place within that building. Um, Islamic practice has been o over many, many, many years that the con the conducting of an agar does not require an imam. Although you know there are some schools of thought that that would um, dispute that, but. Um, you know, I've spoken to women, um, I've attended marriages where a male member of the family has conducted the nikah. The nikahs have happened at um, the, the girl's natal family home, um, or they've taken place at, um, you know, the patriarch of the family, his family home, and then she is then, um, you know, um, handed over to, after the marriage, to her, her husband and his family. From That's where she leaves her natal family home from. So, there... I think even if we registered imams to conduct marriage, religious marriages, it will not be an end to religious only marriages. It will, because there, there will be other, other means through which those marriages can take place. And we have to be very cognizant of that and the implications of that. Yes, thank you, Yasmin. Uh, what I'd like to do now, if possible, is to show uh, the video, uh, an interview that Gita did. It's a brief video of about six minutes with Yehudis Fletcher about um, issues in the um, uh, Jewish community as well and how that is adversely affecting women's lives. So let's watch that now together. Yehudis, could you please introduce yourself? and tell us about the organization you founded and why you founded it. Um, thank you, Gita. Um, I am Yehudis Fletcher. I was born in a Haredi family in Glasgow in Scotland. Haredi um, literally means trembling before God and it refers to a very conservative section of the Jewish community. Um, at the moment, really small in numbers, but with such a high birth rate that by um, in the next 30 years or so, the Haredi community will actually dominate um, the Jewish community in the United Kingdom demographically. Um, so I am a social and political activist. I am studying social policy at Salford University. Um, some years ago, I started talking about sex abuse and the cover-up of sex abuse in the Jewish community. And I realized very quickly that what I was what I was seeing was patterns of actual systemic harm. So it wasn't just the incidents of sex abuse itself. It was how these incidents were treated when they were spoken about, how offenders were characterized and, um, and how anybody who spoke up or any whistleblowers were often silenced in a really systemic way. I then started thinking about other systemic harms that occur in the community and I realized that this is a this is a form of extremism. This is ideologically motivated harm. These are harms that people um, do to people that they otherwise love. These are things that people do because they think it's what God wants of them. They're not evil people who want to go out and hurt their friends and family and community. These are people who want to do right by God. And um, the harms that they perpetrate are ideologically inspired. And that's why we call it extremism. Nachamu was founded to combat that. Nachamu literally means uh, be comforted because Nachamu is not about attacking my community. It's not about burning it down or asking for it to be disestablished. Nachamu is about an ingathering of the people. It's about huddling together and rumbling together as Brene Brown calls it and saying, let's do this together. It hurts, it's hard and we can do hard. So, so I wanted to ask, what is your concern 
if any, with the weddings consultation that the Law Commission is conducting at the moment? How do you think it will affect the women that you want to serve through Nakhamu? Yeah. So at the moment, um, the consultation that the Law Commission um, ha has been engaging in, actually, it doesn't affect our women because our women are already in the Jewish community. Um, the consultation is about extending the rights that women or, or not women, but people in our community already enjoy under mm -hmm. under law or are protected and allowed to engage in under law and it's extending it to other religious groups. So currently Jewish women, we call it, enjoy certain carve outs in um, the Marriage Act. But actually those carve outs that, that um, mean, mean that women in my community are not protected in the same way and don't enjoy that same protection. So they might enjoy a carve out, but the institutions are the ones um, that are enjoying that. And it's women and indeed men who suffer from forced marriage who aren't enjoying the protections that they're entitled to as citizens. Actually, Haredis often have marriages at home, don't they? Or in other places, not in a synagogue, like many Muslim marriages. So, so do they have to have a separate civil ceremony? So it's, it's not usually in a home, although it can happen in a home. It's often in a catering hall or in a school, often, very often on the grounds of a school. Um, Haredim very rarely actually get married in a synagogue. It's more uh, people from the main, more mainstream part of the Jewish community who would get married in a synagogue. And so they, they should um, be having a separate civil ceremony. And many do, but many don't. I got married when I was 18 and I didn't have a separate civil ceremony. So did you find on divorce that you had no civil protection in divorce? Yes, yeah, so there is, if you don't have a civil marriage ceremony, then you can't have a civil divorce ceremony. Now, first of all, that means that that you, you don't have the benefits and that the protections that that would offer you. But also it means that any abuse that occurs is entirely managed within the community. The marriage happens within the community and there's no one from the outside to ask any questions. Are you consenting to this? Do you have the capacity to consent to this? Do you know what this entails? Many girls in my community are getting married without any sex education right up until the last minute. So they might technically agree to the marriage, but they don't know that getting married includes physically consummating that marriage that night. They'll be told that maybe five or six days before the wedding. And at that point, can they really be said to have the... Um, You'd need a lot of power as a 17 or 18 year old girl five days before your wedding to say, I'm not ready for this. And many girls don't have that power. Um, so you don't enjoy the ordinary protections that the state might offer you, um, but also any harms that might be occurring won't be spotted and there's no opportunities or windows for other people to be involved. And I think certain people quite like it that way and would like to see that continue. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I, I know there's still quite a lot of uh, discussions that um, uh, need to happen and we have an audience that needs to be able to speak as well. I would like to just give Pragna Patel one uh, last opportunity. I had many other questions, but it, it, uh, we haven't gotten around it, it, to it. But I'd like Pragna, if you don't mind, please, just to give us some legal um, summary of what the Law Commission is looking at, what a summary of our submissions are, our recommendations are, and where we can go from here. If you don't mind, just briefly, so I can then go to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. I, I think that um, as far as the Law Commission is concerned, it's looking at the whole question of marriage laws. It's looking particularly um, at the for legal formalities needed uh, to for a marriage to be recognised. Um, and it has tried to grapple with some of our concerns, I have to say, not in a very satisfactory manner. And I'm very concerned that its remit is so narrow that it's not going to deal with the very substantive problems that all of us are talking about in relation to women's rights and violations of those rights. Um, one of the two, the two asks that we have is one um, that everybody's alluded to already, including Uzma, which is that um, 
you know, there must be a universal scheme of civil marriages. Um, there's no ifs and buts. Everybody should undergo a civil marriage. And, and actually, in many, particularly Muslim-majority countries, that is the law. They recognize the kind of dangers inherent for women. They recognize the discrimination um, that, you know, uh, that can be um, perpetrated against women and are beginning to try and deal with some of that um, in countries um, such as India, which is my again referred to, but elsewhere as well, um, to deal with the whole question of, um, you know, um, civil marriage and religious marriages. So uh, the first ask is to make it universal that everyone undergoes a civil marriage. Then after that, people do what they want, mm -hmm. have whatever other ceremonies, religious marriages, whatever they want. The second point, and this is something that we are, we don't think that the Law Commission will look into the civil marriage point at all because it said it's, it's outside of its remit which is very, very disappointing because, as I said earlier, the courts actually batted back this question when it came up in the Okta versus Khan case and said it's for the Law Commission to look at. And the Law Commission is now saying that it's not within its remit. So already I feel that we will be, minority women will be shafted. But in any event, the second question, the second ask is to make coercion and deception a grounds for voiding a marriage. And what does that mean? That means that even though the marriage has not met all the formalities of a marriage, all the legal formalities of the marriage, the court would recognize the need to grant a remedy uh, where, you know, um, there are certain, where certain criteria have been met and um, where it would be unjust and against the interests of women's human rights not to grant a legal remedy. And that's exactly the point that was being um, determined in the Okta versus Khan case, uh, which was, I can't remember now, I think it's 2018 or so. But the point of that case was precisely Mrs. Okta, who had um, turned up to court, who had only a nikah, had never had a religious marriage. She herself was a solicitor. So she knew that the religious marriage had no legal status. Um, but nevertheless, she was forced down that route because her husband, you know, said that he wanted the religious marriage and he promised to have a civil marriage afterwards. That never transpired. She had children with him, many, many years of marriage, which was recognized for the purposes of tax um, and welfare benefits and so on. And yet when in court, her marriage was not recognized. She was seen as someone in a non-marriage because she didn't, you know, the marriage just had not been registered. And the, the point of that is that she wanted um, the marriage to be deemed void, which would have led to the courts granting a decree of nullity, which is basically a way of granting her her rights, particularly to matrimonial and financial assets. And that was important. And it, I, I do want to come back to this point about what was the Akhtar versus Khan case about. It wasn't, I know that it seems as if it was about recognizing a religious marriage. It wasn't. And in fact, the court itself, uh, the Court of Appeal, did not recognize uh, the religious marriage of Mrs. Akhtar. And we say that's right. But what we do say is that where there is an injustice, the state has an obligation to remedy that injustice and the law must provide those rem remedies for that injustice. That's a subtly different point to saying recognize a religious marriage. What we're talking about is you know, the need to remedy this, but in the long term, what we're talking about is the, the state should bring in a scheme, a universal scheme, of civil registration that's compulsory, no opt-out. You can choose to have any other type of marriage afterwards, but no opt-out. And to void a marriage, coercion and deception should be accepted as a ground. We're hoping the Law Commission will engage with that argument. I'm not very hopeful. I really do feel, as others have pointed out, that basically minority women are being shafted in all directions. Yeah.
Uh, thank you very much, Pragna. I'd like to, there's, there's about uh, 15 minutes left for our um, webinar, and I would like to make sure that we answer some of the questions and give an opportunity to all the, the speakers to, to speak. Um, there, if I can just maybe uh, read a couple of the questions out and ask you each briefly to, to respond to them, and then we'll move on to the next set of questions. Uh, one of the things uh, that was said um, was by Aisha, who said that the UK um, doesn't accept, uh, does accept nikahs from different countries, but not when it's uh, taken place within Britain by a British citizen, which seems uh, very unfair. That's one question. The other is from uh, Rahila Gupta, who, uh, who, who asks, uh, whether as secular feminists there is any ideological philosophical reasons uh, to oppose religious marriages but even though she says she understands the importance of recognizing them um, uh, but would, would as her question is whether there are any reasons left to oppose religious marriages uh, lots of people are thanking Uzma in particular for sharing her wonderful uh, speaking so wonderfully and sharing her devastating story, but also, you know, giving us uh, just, uh, you know, us seeing how strong she is, how brave she is. It, 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 a lot of people are mentioning that. Some are mentioning the fact that um, Heather Harvey's mentioned the fact that the consultation's closed and how can people still respond if they want to. Uh, can I ask uh, the speakers if they'd like to address any of these and then we'll go back to uh, further questions and comments. Please, uh, Gita, would you like to go ahead? Actually, I'd like to back up a bit and explain some of the things that may be causing a little bit of confusion because we put so many quite complex things together in mm. uh, quite a short time. So. The Law Commission is doing a consultation on weddings, which is what uh, set us off on having the seminar. And I think it should be the first of many because we really need to talk to people who are practitioners as well as people who are experiencing these issues and, you know, come to some kind of understanding because people are asking for practical help uh, and so on as well. And we can't do all of that tonight. But the Law Commission is having this weddings consultation for the admirable purpose in abstract of rationalizing British weddings law. Because at the moment, there are various uh, different communities, religious communities have access to different forms of recognition of their marriages. So the Ch Church of England, you can marry in one place in church and the church will register your marriage. And it is also therefore a civil marriage as well as a religious marriage. As Yehudis Fletcher explained, some parts of the Jewish community, many people think Jews have the same, um, what she was calling the carve out, the same privilege, as it were, of being able to have their uh, synagogues as places of registration. But there's a, a part of the Jewish community that is ultra Orthodox Jews, which, as she explained, have exactly the same problems as other people, Muslims and others, who are not marrying in a registered building or have married in a registered building, but people failed to met read the Imam or whoever was in charge fail to register the marriage for them. So what the Law Commission is proposing, and this is something that as feminists we really have to be very aware of, is to religionize civil marriage. Yasmin explained this briefly, she mentioned it briefly. What they're proposing is to license people, imams, rabbis, pundits, etc., as marriage registrars. Now the marriage registrar has a lot of civil functions, including operating the hostile environment. That's a function we disagree with, but it's an important function as far as the state's concerned in checking people's identity documents and things like that. We do not think that it is a good idea to allow religious people to become officiants as a way of equalizing conditions between the Church of England and other religions because that is what the Law Commission is proposing. It's also proposing to give these religious groups the option of, ha of planning the marriage according to their own law. That's what Yasmin was referring to when she said they may stop interfaith marriages or same-sex marriages. And it specifically says that they can be allowed not to perform same-sex marriages if they choose. So in other words, 
the civil marriage system will be polluted with all the discrimination that exists in religious marriages. At the moment, a Christian woman registrar who did not want to perform same-sex marriages went to an employment tribunal saying that her uh, religious beliefs prevented her from performing same-sex marriages and her case, she lost her, her case because if she's a registrar, she has to perform marriages according to the law and same-sex marriages have been recognized in law and she has to be able to perform them. So I think it's very dangerous for the civil marriage system. It's in introducing what in effect is a millet system, the Ottoman system of multiple religions into the civil marriage system, which so far has not been like it. So instead of solving the problem of the collapse in civil marriages, which they think they'll solve by, you know, making the imams and others, but it's imams they're worried about, rabbis also, responsible for registering the civil marriage. We already know there's a lot of corruption in the system. I don't see that that corruption will end. I don't see the, the male domination of that system, the patriarchal religious fundamentalist domination will end. In fact, it's a state giving the keys to the kingdom. That is what we're worried about in essence. Now there are a lot of concerns and really cries of despair from women who want their religious marriages recognized. What we're saying is that the state has a duty to recognize that harm has been done and therefore to give women their rights. Mm -hmm. And one way could be to recognize cohabitation rights of people who are recognized cohabitees, not the secret marriages Yasmin is talking about, but these public marriages that Uzma described where women don't see themselves as being in a hole and corner relationship. They're in a public marriage. They consider it their, the marriage for life. And um, you know they need to be able to give, be given rights if that marriage ends for whatever reason. And the state has a responsibility there. The state has specifically struck down a judgment, uh, which, which uh, Pragna mentioned, uh, where a woman was given her rights uh, by the marriage being declared void. Therefore, it upheld the, the, the principle of civil marriage, but it also gave her her rights at the ending of the marriage. Mm -hmm. And this, the government actually went to court to challenge this. And to say, we don't want this, we're going to strike it down for the abstract principle of upholding civil marriage. And yet the wedding, weddings consultation is undermining the very basis of civil marriage and turning it into a series of religious marriages mm -hmm. with people being given considerable power by the state to be officiants and actually to practice their corruption more openly, in my okay. view. Thank and you. I think that is... Thank you, uh, Gita. Can I ask uh, if uh, Osma, would you like to um, respond to any of the questions or comments or any of the things you've heard or just add uh, your uh, ending comments, basically, because we have very few minutes left. If you can uh, please take the floor and um, it's, it's yours. Yes, thank everyone for listening to me. This is this might seem just like a story, but this is my life. In a year, I'm talking about not just my life, I'm talking about three other children's life. Who is at stake? My children are under child protection. Okay, they have been mentally abused and they have not been going to school properly and obviously is unable to parent their children. I am in this situation only because of the fact that if at all there was any sort of a penalty for this man for doing what he's done to me, I would not be in this situation. My children would not be in this situation. Um, you, I wish I was in India. You know, I honestly think that if I was in that country, third world country, I would have got some justice from the government, from the courts, from some some organization who would have made this man. There are small, very small uh, women's group who have their own way of dealing with such things. You know, there will be leaders or uh, MPs who would just sit around, men in powerful uh, positions who would sit around and make a decision for a woman like me if I have to go around and talk to some uh, uh, ministers and say that this is my story, I need help. They would in some way put it down, bring him, call him and tell him that, look, this is the situation. 
this needs to be done i might not get 50% but i would get something from this man to start my life now i am dependent on the government if the government just understands what it is doing there are six professionals in my children's life right now okay social workers school mentor uh, mental assessor so many other professionals and you know i have a social worker the government is okay to pay for my benefits they are paying for my rent they are paying for my support everything but the government does not recognize the fact that he is the one who is responsible for me to be in this situation he needs to be penalized there has to be something to be done about this i need justice i want justice not for myself i don't know i might not be able to get anything but yes if i can contribute in any other way for my future generation maybe my granddaughters would be girls and i want to secure their their future all the every woman in this world have to be secured by these men who think it is so easy we are we are not a piece of furniture we are human we have, we are a same human like them we are not different sexes we are human we are one people similar rights we we eat drink sleep do the same things as men but our rights are different we don't have diff- we, we shouldn't be t- treated differently we have to uh, the government needs to understand there has to be someone who has to take responsibility for this that's all i'd say mm-hmm. and I'd, i would like to thank everyone who's into this to make this change geeta pragna mariam you all are doing really well very good well done for doing what you're doing but there has to be a change we need to do something about this it's it's i'm not the only one there are million other women who are still in these abusive relationships only because they know for a fact that they don't have a choice mm-hmm. if they want to get out of this marriage they will not get anything so they mm-hmm. choose to stay with that abusive marriage for the sake of the children and they know that they don't have a choice they have they they cannot rebuild their life they are in the 50s or they are in the 60s or they are in the 40s or 30s they don't want to lose out so they prefer mm. to stay in that marriage because they know they have no way out of this mm. so thank you thank you Uzma. that's all i would say and thank, thank you for uh for that i think uh it's thank a huge you. hugely important contribution to this discussion as has been that of Geeta Sahgal uh, Pragna Patel and Yasmin Rehman i do want to give i know we've just got 1 minute left i'd like uh Yasmin Rehman if you can just uh tell us uh about something that Uzma mentioned which is the fact that you you know triple you can't do triple talaq in uh, India but you can do it here and get away with it and so this this uh, and and the fact that in many muslim majority countries actually uh, civil marriage is a requirement uh, in addition to the fact that the nikah is seen as a civil contract so if you can just briefly mention that and i'd like to end with pragna patel just you know if you can summarize after yasmin where we are what we need to do and how to go about go about it but i'll give the floor first to you yasmin please okay um thank thank you mariam and thank you wasma um it's moved me to tears um i have to say that um it breaks my heart that in 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 pakistan and in india there is a demand there is a requirement that you register your marriage mm. they move now against the triple talaq the indian muslim women have been out on the streets march and demanding their rights and we have my muslim sisters in this country have been acquiescing to the religious leadership and i do not understand that i do not understand the fact that we have forgotten our histories our histories of standing proud and fighting for our rights a right that our religion gives us and and the state gives us that is a requirement mariam you're absolutely right in in india pakistan bangladesh and other muslim majority contexts that the marriage is registered just as you would read new we want our children born to the sound of the azan but we also want to register their births we want to have um religious funerals but we also want our deaths registered the one thing does not preclude the other it doesn't preclude the other but one the last point i want to make is that the, the british state at this mo- at this moment in time is allowing alternative dispute resolution systems the religious courts the sharia courts 
are allowing men to divorce by text message. Technology has caught up with Muslim men where it suits them, they use it. Mm. Or to, to send a talaq um, petition by email, mm. recognizing that where in Muslim majority countries it is not being recognized. Mm. They are making a mockery of both their religion and um, circumventing the state at every opportunity. And who suffers? It's women and children who suffer. Mm. We stop this. Thank you very much, Yasmin. And if we can just end with Pragna Patel, and I think if I could ask you, Pragna, as well, I mean, to focus on uh, the issue of secularism, I think the separation of religion uh, from the state, the fact that it's so important that people have their right to religion, but I, I firmly believe, and I think uh, very many of us here do, that you do need a separation of religion uh, from the state, from the law, particularly uh, in order to protect women's rights and, uh, in this case, minority women's rights. And also, you know, what are the next steps? What do we need to do? Uh, what are the things we should all be pushing for as uh, women's rights campaigners? Um yeah, okay. So very, very briefly, I think that some of the key takeaways from this, um, particularly Uzma highlighted all the takeaways because she talked about, you know, how women's lives are not single issues. She talked about how the intersection of hostile environment with conservative religious leaderships, with domestic violence, with state indifference, you know, and the ways in which um, a religious only marriage leads to deprivation of not just marital rights and properties, but pension rights, welfare benefits, and so on and so forth. And I think that was a really, really important point that we're talking about women, minority women's rights, not in the abstract the reality of minority women's rights, the consequences, the harmful, serious consequences that flow from these deprivation of these rights, you know, and the ways in which minority women have over decades struggled to get out of the private sphere are being pushed back into the private sphere because of the collusion between religious leaderships and the state. So, you know, that's a real serious matter and it touches on issues of women's rights in the family, but beyond that, women's right to education, women's right to the work, you know, to uh, participation in the workplace, mm -hmm. women's rights as, civ as civic actors and so on. Um, the other thing was something that both Gita and Yasmin and Yehudis also touched on, which is the religionization of our communities, mm -hmm. the way in which this is yet the latest ways in which that religionization is taking place. And it's really, really scary. And although, you know, we talked a lot about the fact that when um, the whole issue about um, the compulsion towards religious only marriage is happening in largely Muslim communities, other minority communities will follow suit because mm. they too want more and more women to be under the control of per so-called personal laws, community-based laws, and to be subject to community-based systems of governance. So, you know, this is not just a question for Muslim women, it's actually a question for all minority women, but beyond that, for all women and all feminists. And of course, that does lead us to make the demand clearly for a separate separation between church and state, between religion and law. Mm -hmm. And it also, you know, makes it clear for us that, you know, our struggle is based on the fact that our citizenship, the basis of our citizenship as women is human rights and not religion. That is, I think, at the heart of what we're all saying here, that, you know, this is ultimately about how women uh, assert their rights and what is the basis of those rights. And so far, the state and religious leaderships want it to be religion and we want it to be civil and human rights. And, and in terms of, you know, what next, I think that um, the first thing is that the Law Commission is going to fail us. I think the Law Commission is not going to grapple with half of these issues, if any, and they'll throw piecemeal things at us at best and at worst do exactly what people are predicting, which is give more power to religious leaderships to control marriage and sexuality in every aspect of women's lives. So I think that we've got some major campaign ahead 
in terms of both scrutinizing and monitoring what the law commission does and obviously dealing with that when it when they finally report but more widely we have to carry on making the demand for a civil registration scheme for all marriages and we have to carry on making demands for women to um, be able to, minority women to be able to assert their rights in all directions. Mm -hmm. And we have to kind of take on that kind of multiple simultaneous struggle mm -hmm. against, you know, commun oppressive community systems of governance and oppressive state systems of governance, including the hostile environment at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, our work is really cut out. And what we really need above everything else is allies. We need the rest of the women's movement behind us, you know, women's groups behind us, women's organizations behind us. Mm -hmm. we, we are standing up, all of us are women from minority communities, standing up. What we want are people to support us, not to speak for us. So people should not feel scared. People should not feel scared of being labeled Islamophobic or racist in supporting our demands. Because if we don't get that support, then we're failing women like Uzma. Mm. And, you know, and that is on our hands and history won't look kindly on us. So I think it's incumbent on everyone to understand that these are feminist issues and their uh, secularism is a feminist issue, um, but these are issues for all of us. Yes, thank you very much, Pragna. I mean, the reality is that defending women's rights, defending women's universal rights has nothing to do with bigotry and racism. In fact, it has everything to do with treating everyone, including minority women, as equal citizens deserving of the same rights as everybody else. And I think that's something that's really uh, that, that we've been pushing for throughout and support and solidarity is key here. I want to thank you, Pragna Patel, for your um, contributions, Gita Sahgyal for your contributions, Yasmin Rehman for your contributions, and uh, of course, uh, Yehuda Fletcher for Yehuda's Fletcher for hers, as well as our, our star tonight, Uzma, who uh, re really uh, stole all of our hearts. And um, hopefully uh, we'll continue to fight for these rights and demands because it affects so many women like Uzma and so many others who are uh, in this room as well, uh, as well as in, in society as large. This uh, seminar will be on YouTube. It'll be available. Uh, so hopefully you can access it again there and also share it with those who weren't able to come. Thank you so much to our wonderful audience. I'm sorry uh, we didn't give enough time for questions and answers, but this is such a complex issue. And uh, it, it, uh, we, we did try to address various aspects of it. Hopefully we can do more of these. Thank you again. Stay safe and uh, take care and see you on the front lines.